Let us pray. Lord, I pray that you will use these imperfect words and all our thoughts to bring us ever closer to your divine truth. Amen. Good day. I'm Alan Yates, an elder serving in Trinity United Reformed Church in High Wycombe, and my short talk today comes from a collision of One World Week and Black History Month, and is entitled Commands and Complications. I guess as soon as I mention the word complications, the first thing that springs to mind quicker than my son's Cavapoo puppy is how complicated the COVID-19 regulations are. Now, please don't turn your PC off just yet, because that's the last time I'm going to mention the dreaded C word today. But I just wanted to use it as an example of how we seem to like to complicate things. This is not a recent phenomenon, as experienced as evidenced by Einstein, recognising the fact when he stated, genius is making complex ideas simple not making simple ideas complex. But even Einstein was not the first to recognise this human tendency. Let's go back to 1300 BC, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone. These commandments were, and are, relatively clear and easy to understand. You don't need a law degree to understand them, and they're not bizarre or incompatible with common human decency. All in all, quite an accessible set of rules, even though most of them tell you what not to do rather than what you should do. And perhaps our present day communications might benefit if we had to chisel them out of stone. I guess 1,000 word sermons would be a thing of the past. However, by the time the Pentateuch was in its finished form, the rules governing our behaviour had lost their simplicity. The number of laws a Jew had to observe had risen from 10 to 613. And about the only good thing I can say for such an abundance of regulation is that lots of them were phrased in the positive format, telling you what you needed to do. Unfortunately, even that was not the end to regulation inflation. By the time Jesus arrives on the scene, the complexity of the laws had risen dramatically. For example, the laws governing work to enable the fourth commandment to be observed and to keep the Sabbath day holy evolved into 39 different categories of work, which then became more than 600 specific bans, and that was for just one of the Ten Commandments. Complicated or what? For those of you who, like me, are fully paid up members of the Bears with Little Brains Club, I fail to see how anyone can be sure of, of observing such a body of law so vast and diverse that it is almost unknowable. It feels to me, if in those days the ordinary Jews were destined to be perpetual sinners. And if you know you can't succeed at, at obeying the law, why would you bother with any of it in the first place? It's clear that the Pharisees in Christ's time also recognised there was an issue with the vast body of law. Because, as John Proctor tells us in his commentary on Matthew, the question about which is the greatest commandment was a common question in Jewish legal circles. And so, in an incredibly straightforward message, Jesus clears the fog of words and simply tells us to love the Lord absolutely and to love our neighbour as ourselves. Simples, as our little furry friend would say. And yet there was, and is, an issue with understanding who our neighbours are. In English today, we tend to use the word neighbour in a much narrower sense 
than the contemporaries of Levi would. Our neighbours tend to be those who live in the few houses either side of us. But for the Levi's, a neighbour would be anyone who lives in their neighbourhood or land. In other words, their fellow Jews. So, although Jesus was repeating a regulation that was first pen, penned in Leviticus, he changed its meaning significantly, particularly if we consider his words in the parable of the Good Samaritan and further on in Matthew 25 when he talks about judgment. A neighbour could be anyone, even someone from a different race or region. As we come to the end of Black History Month, it is worth putting our Bible readings into context. The Bible is not a history of white Europeans. As far as I am aware, all but a few people mentioned in the Bible are people of colour, not white. I think the only white European mentioned by name in the Bible is Pilate, the Roman i.e. Italian, governor at the time of Jesus. There are a few centurions mentioned who may have been Italian, but none are named, and yet all are treated as neighbours by Jesus. It is clear that a person's colour does not change their status as our neighbour, and yet that is what Europeans have been doing since the 17th century, and this has got to stop. A few years ago, while I was riding my bike in Turkey, I stopped at the top of a particularly arduous hill. As I was resting, a man from a nearby house came out with a bowl of sweets for us, giving us the quick burst of sugar that we all needed. The chances are that this fellow had not read Matthew's Gospel, but he certainly did understand what Jesus meant by the word neighbour. The URC has embarked upon a journey from, from being a church that is not racist to one that is anti-racist. In other words, a church that actively seeks to eliminate all forms of racism and exclusion. If anybody is interested in understanding this journey and our contributions to Black History Month, please go to the URC website, urc.org.uk, and follow the links for Black History Month and the legacies of slavery. So at this time of complexity and confusion, and as we come to the end of One World Week and Black History Month, let us take on board Christ's simple command to love our fellow human beings, all of them, independent of their colour, creed, or any other arbitrary difference. But let me finish with a word of warning. Being simple does not mean this command is easy to live by. We will all need the help and all the help we can get. Let us pray. Lord, I pray that you will help us to fully live our lives according to your two great commandments. And when we slip, as we will, beneath your exacting standards, give us the wisdom to acknowledge our failings and the courage to address them. Amen.